Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum at Cadence Independent Media. Today we are talking about something that's important to me, it is snare beds. What are they? Why are they? Uh, why do we need them? Do we need them at all? Let's find out. Snare beds are a ignored part of drums. I think people play their drums and don't really think about them that much because either the drum is sounding good or it's not. But the nature of the snare bed and the choices and wires that it also forces you to make are really, really important. Over the years of building what we consider to be a standard snare drum since you know the turn of the century, basically, a lot of changes have happened to snare beds and a lot of very old drums don't have them. Um, some modern drums do. Let's talk about what they are for starters. If you take the heads off of your drum and set the batter side on a table, you'll see no light really coming out from underneath. It's dead flat. If you turn the drum over and set it on the table, you'll see that where the mechanism is, there are indentations in the shell. And these indentations are called the snare beds. They're called that because that's where the wires lay. And the wires themselves don't actually lay on them. The strap or the strings comes across the snare beds ordinarily to help kind of lay them flat against the head. Now, snare beds can be very shallow. They can be very narrow. They can be very deep, very wide, a lot of different things. Some of them are super extreme. Some modern drums are very extreme. And we have a couple of old drums here that also have sort of surprising indentations in the heads that almost look like a mistake. I've actually seen people uh, selling drums online where they say there are some dents in the bottom of the shell that look like they've been there for a long time. Uh, very old Slingerland or um, Ludwig drums from like the 20s, you can see that the snare beds are actually pressed in and there's a fold in the head because they would do the edge and then they would kind of like pound it in or press it in. And it does look like damage, but it's not. So the first drum we're gonna look at today is the House Superphonic 70s. Um, we have three more also that are a little more um, noticeable. This is probably the least aggressive snare bed of the lot, apart from the drum you'll see in a minute that actually doesn't have one at all. The Superphonic has a very wide and very shallow snare bed. And what this means is that the drum can use a lot of different kinds of wires, a lot of different widths of wires. And it is an articulate drum, but it has a fundamental fatness to it that I think is why it's popular as a recording drum and also as a funk drum in particular, because you can tune it super high and it doesn't ever get to that spot where it's supposed to feel like popcorn and not have that sort of sense of being able to play into it. Um, the flip side of that is that if you have wider wires on it, you're never going to get a super crispy, super articulate sound out of it. So like I was saying a minute ago, your choice of wires in, in conjunction with the snare beds of your drum can actually take you to a place where one drum will be very versatile depending on your wire choice if you understand the nature of the snare beds. The beds on this drum are almost invisible unless you look across the edge and you can see that they reach probably to the two lugs past the two that are adjacent to the wires. And then the drum is actually level at the outside lugs, and then it already starts to swoop in out here. That is super fun if you wanna get really wide wires, like 30 or 42 strand wires. You can put them on here, put a ring on the top and get that almost like sample sound where you kinda of hit it in the center and don't catch the rim. And it just sounds like wires and that's it. Um, and so there are some drums that you absolutely can't get away with that on. And likewise, if you put like 12 or 16 strand orchestral wires on this drum and kind of flatten the snare side head a little more rather than having it follow the slope of the bearing edge, you can really get a incredibly crispy sound out of it too. You can have a set of wires that work fantastically on one drum and not on another. And it can also be influenced by the actual mechanism and the, the plate on the back of the drum. Uh, and also what you use to mount the wire, strap or string, different things like that. And with each drum that I have, and I, I think, you know, any of these that are Ben's as well, you kind of like fiddle with them a little bit and see what that drum likes. And then once you figure it out, you know, you know, there's like a prescription almost for some drums. Um, for instance, uh, if you've seen the, like the Keplinger video from, you know, a few months ago, Greg really likes super narrow wires and I did not understand why until I started playing his drums and I realized that they are hyper resonant in the low end. So unless you're cranking it up, even 20 strand wires on that drum sound like 42 strand wires on this drum. So those are things to know, you know, learn your drum, learn what it likes. 
Next is sort of a quintessential modern drum. That was a 70s. This is sort of like from now or now-ish. This is a Pearl Masters Maple Custom Extra. And basically what that means is we're talking about a maple ply drum fundamentally here. And this drum has something uh, to the snare beds that I think has become sort of normal in modern drums, which is narrower than the Supra, a little bit deeper, and the scoop in is a little bit sharper, so it's almost more like a shelf rather than just like a, a bite out of a cookie. And this drum can also use a wide variety of wires. Uh, I don't think that either of us have ever put 42s on this. I can see by the width of the beds that I think 30s would be fine. It has to do with whether or not the sides of the wires are in the slope of the bed or not. If the bed is super narrow, then the wires on the outside, the actual end, the, the plate on the end of the wires is not going to be involved in the snare bed where it slopes down to get them to lay. So the outside wires are going to just be flapping in the breeze and the center ones, you're going to be tightening it down to try to get articulation and then it just sounds sloppy all the time. This is also, versus the Supra, a wood drum so they have sanded the edges in here rather than the Supra where the whole thing is actually shaped that way. So these are flattened versus the sharp edge of the rest of the snare side of the drum. And the Supra, the edge is the same everywhere because it's metal, so they just make it match. They bend it in that way. And that's nice too because it means that there's a sort of soft rounded area for the strings or straps or whatever to lay across rather than a sharp edge that's gonna crimp your strings and maybe damage the head if you use, you know, like wire, wire strings to hold it on. This sort of snare bit to me is super versatile because it's not as broad as the Supra, but it still is wide enough that you can use a lot of different kinds of wires. Um, but this drum, just from having used it, is fundamentally super articulate because of the nature of these beds. All right, next up is a fan favorite. It's Ben's Gretsch 4105 60s. Uh, super cool drum. It's six lugs. And this one has an even more severe snare bed than anything we've put up yet. It's narrower and it's also deeper. And this one is beveled inside the same way as the rest of the bearing edge. They sanded it in and then they did the bevel again. And this is a really great drum. And it is also, you know, it can be a little finicky sometimes, uh, both because of it being six lugs and also because of the nature of the snare bed. And this brings up a topic uh, that we've talked about before with leveling the snare side head and using a ruler and all that stuff. And after going through all of these drums, and it's particular drums that aren't mine where I've experimented with it and kind of like had to learn my way around each of them, uh, I've come to the conclusion that there's kind of two directions to go with this that are specific to the snare bed that you have. And basically, if you have a really wide, really shallow one, like on the, on the Superphonic, you can take the ruler, go around, and make all the lug, all the nodal points at the lugs the same height. With a drum that has a super deep or a super narrow snare bed, you're not going to be able to get the right kind of tension around the beds if you do that because of so like the degree of scoop that goes into this, the shell. So the narrower and deeper the snare bed, the more I think about the bottom head actually being more like a tabletop in terms of the, the rim itself. So for instance, like I have a Donette snare at home that has ridiculous beds. They're like half an inch deep and it looks like, you know, you took a bite out of it. And I fussed with it for a long time trying to like level around and you can't actually really do it with a ruler because the differential in the beds is so crazy. So what I started doing was just tightening the outside lugs to see if I could get the wrinkles to go away that were in the snare beds. And it got to where it was sounding fantastic. And I looked at it and I was like, huh, it's actually, the rim is flat. Like if I set this side of the drum on a table, it sits flat. And I found that to be true with older Gretsches and also with kind of like, you know, 20s, Black Beauties, that kind of thing where the, the, some of the snare beds are like an inch and a half wide and they're chopped out like that. You're never gonna get those wrinkles out and you'll end up cranking these lugs down to try to get rid of the wrinkles and just kind of ruin the head or even have the edge of the drum break the head, which, you know, we have a friend who has one like that too and he asked me to work on it for him. I broke the head trying to get it level. So uh, these are all just things to know with, with every drum that you have. And this guy in particular, this is a narrow wire drum, like 20 is maybe the max. 
And it sounds phenomenal with those. It sounds phenomenal with 12s and 16s. If you put 30s on here, you know right away that it's things get weird fast. And you can alleviate the floppy outside wires by tensioning the outside lugs a little bit, but it's not really worth the trouble. Like the sound isn't different or better enough to me. Um, this sounds great with 20s, so 20s it is. We got lucky and found a drum in the shop here that has no <laughs> snare beds at all. And uh, a couple of people have asked about this when we were doing the snare wire triage video and when we were doing uh, leveling the snare side head. What do you do if the drum doesn't have snare beds? And that was something that I always in the back of my mind sort of thought of as like budget drums or certain vintage drums. And then somebody told me that the some of the Yamaha Dave Weckl drums with the double strainers didn't have snare beds because it was like complicated to cut two snare beds and they didn't want to cut one that wide. And I was like, huh, that's crazy. But here we have a Star Classic Maple Babinga that is a beautiful, high quality professional drum, has no snare beds at all. This is probably the drum here at the studio that I've spent the least amount of time with, but I have played it a fair amount and I didn't know that it didn't have snare beds. And I knew that some wires worked well. I knew that it was a little fussy with different heads sometimes, or like certain tensions would work and other tensions that seemed like they should work would be boxy or weird. Um, and I, th I think now we kind of know why, which is that when you have a totally flat drum and you tension the wires against it immediately, you can see why they figured out pretty early on that you needed to have a scoop in to get the wires to lay. It has to do with the angle of tension on the wires and getting them to be evenly tensioned all the way. Because if you're pulling downward out here, you're pulling downward on the wires a little bit. And if there isn't a slope into that pressure, the wires want to go like this because you're pulling on the ends, but you're also pulling down. And if they're sloped down like that, you get a little more of like an angled tension on them, which means that as you tension them up, you're not choking the edges and pulling the center away. And likewise, you're also not tensioning the center and messing with the edges, which is what happens when you have a narrow, deep bed and you put super wide wires on it. You're getting pressure where you don't want it. You've got the way that the edge is actually cut for the sake of the head to contend with. You've also got the what the drum is made of, which is the same as any of them, but with these in particular, I think it takes a little more experimentation to figure out what works, and it may be a little bit of a narrower scope of what you can or can't use. Um, but for me, in general, the place to start is 20 strand, regular gauge wires, um, you know, whatever brand you prefer. Make sure you try straps and strings, because I definitely, I don't think I have any drums that like straps and strings equally. They all seem to sound better across the spectrum with one or the other. And as soon as you do it up, put them on there, tension them up, you'll hear if it's better or worse than the other one. And then you can say, okay, that's strap drum and I don't have to think about it anymore. And then if that's a drum you're using, you know, bring extra straps to your gig, especially if you're hitting hard in case they break. Uh, don't ever forget that. <laughs> and make sure you take the time to try out different tensions on the snare side head and different tensions on the wires because each drum is going to have its own wants and needs. And there's no sense fighting it, you know, like... If you've got an Acrolyte, like an Acrolyte's never gonna be a Bell Brass, but a Bell Brass is also never gonna be an Acrolyte, so they're all valuable, and learn what the thing likes. I mean, I said that in a lot of videos, but learn what the drum likes, because it'll help you make music and make music easier. We're gonna do sort of a part two to this video where we take a couple of these drums that have dramatically different edges and go through a wide variety of wires, widths, maybe brands, materials, all that stuff. And hopefully, uh, the, you know, this is sort of like the intellectual side of it, and the next one's going to be like the sonic side of it, where you can hear, you know, what happens when you put 42s on a thing with no edge or put 12s on a vintage drum versus, you know, Gibraltar 20s or whatever. So hopefully this is helpful. Um, if you have any questions about snare beds, you know, drop us a line. And uh, hopefully this will lead you to <laughs> learning about your drum a little better and get a sound you can use. And as usual, please like, comment, subscribe, and... Go work on those wires. <laughs>